Our next team then are the Salford Primary Care Together team. Thank you very much. Give me a round of applause. So I'm really, really pleased to be here today and to see all of you. It's such a joy to see so many faces and to actually see who we're talking to rather than going through that screen. So fantastic GMTH for organising this. Thank you. Okay. Um, not very good at tech. Oh, there we go. Right. <laughs> so I'm actually following the advice of Shenny. I'm going to ask all of you, could you please check that you're okay? Um, the reason why I do that is we're going to talk to you about trauma-informed care. And some of the things we may cover when we talk to you about that are not easy to hear and they're going to remind you about times when you've faced trauma yourselves. So if you need to take a break, that's okay. I'm fine with that. Look after yourself first. Now I've put up the definition of trauma because my job um, in this um, talk is to tell you a bit about what trauma is and make sure that we're all uh, on the same page understanding the same thing. And what I'd really like you to think about when we talk about trauma is the impact on the individual. The fact that trauma is about threat. Um, so it's threat to the self, it's threat of survival, threat of security, threat of belonging. So trauma means threat. And it can come in all sorts of forms. And I think the most important thing in terms of that, well, perhaps we all know about threat following this past year. We've all had some type of threat. Um, we may have known people who were ill. We may have been supporting people who were ill. We've had threats to how we do our work. We've had to change everything. We don't know um, what the future looks like. So we are all experiencing some degree of threat. So we have all experienced some degree of trauma in this past year. And from this perspective of understanding, um, I'd like to take a bit of time explaining how trauma affects individuals, um, ourselves, our society, and recognise that um, because it's common, because we've all experienced it, um, trauma is now something that we should all think about is everyday business, um, it should be part of our thinking every day. Oops, can't coordinate, moving the slides and moving my talk a bit. Of course, I'm not following that, but there we go. <laughs> um, what we've got here is a picture demonstrating the definition I gave to you, and I think what I want to draw your attention to, it's probably not very clear, I was hoping it was going to be a bit clearer, but trauma has an intersection. We have a one-off event, so we're thinking about 20 years ago when the Twin Towers um, attack occurred, we think about the Manchester Arena attack, so they're all things that were one-off events. But all of the people who experienced that have had long-term um, complications from that. But even more than that, trauma is about uh, persistent 
long-term life experiences that um, can have such a huge impact on us. And when I'm thinking about that, um, I think the important thing that we want to get across, some people are more at risk of this complex trauma. This is where social inequality, where poverty, um, lack of a network, a social network, homelessness, um, where disability, being in a different group, all come in. And the most predictive of negative outcomes, and I really wanted to read this out to you because in some ways I was a little bit shocked by one of them. So poverty, bullying, social discrimination, and childhood disability. So the one that shocked me was childhood disability, but then I started thinking about it and I started understanding it's because of the discrimination, because of the difference, and they experience life differently, and that has the long-term impact on them. Of course, I'm probably going to go over time, and the other two are probably going to say, hurry up, please, so I'll, I'll just uh, move myself along. Sorry about that. So I'm wondering, when I put this slide up, which is giving you a little bit of a taster of the various things that may be associated with trauma. Do any of these surprise you? Just want you to think about that. And I'd like to share with you what surprised me. On these slides, there's something that says critical illness is a complex and persistent trauma and it leads to all sorts of problems. And I hadn't thought about it that way, but when I saw the information, it made sense. And the other thing that was surprised me, being a young carer. So being a young carer means you're excluded from your peer group, you're doing something very different and you're not able to always share that experience and the experience itself can be quite frightening because you're exposed to the adult world. So I felt those were important things to share with you. That's my learning thinking about trauma. Uh, but the next thing I wanted to just touch on very briefly um, witnessing trauma or hearing about trauma can have um, an effect on us through secondary traumatisation. Uh, and so again the importance, as Shenny has been talking to us earlier on, of looking after ourselves is really important here. How common is trauma? Well, that phrase, common is common, well, trauma is common. And I found these figures quite frightening. These are from some research done in 2014 by Bellis et al. However, lots of research has been done on trauma and all the figures are extremely similar. So there's strong evidence that these sorts of figures, this is how much trauma um, is out and about. And so what I'd like to draw your attention to, it means that we're going to see people who've been uh, affected by trauma every day. And it also means, if you look at these figures, that we might see quite a number of people who've had uh, four or more really adverse life experiences or experiences of trauma that are persistent. So it's worth understanding what trauma does to us when we see these sorts of figures. 
Um, this I just want to touch on very quickly. So I'm just drawing your attention to trauma being something that affects it at all sorts of levels. I want you to see that there's a Maslow's hierarchy there um, and every single one of those hierarchies can be affected by trauma of some sort. When you get the slides, study this because it's really informative. The next thing that I want to touch on, because I think I'm running over time, <laughs> um, is the fact that um, trauma, and this is some research done in 1998, um, trauma um, if you have more than four um, really big types of trauma can mean that you die 20 years earlier in your life. It can also mean that you're so distressed, it's so hard to deal with what's happened to you, that you use health behaviours that are not healthy to help you cope. And those health behaviours, perhaps we'll call them unhealthy, um, lead to other problems. So really, this should be in the public health arena. We should be doing something about this. Uh, this research told us that in 1998, we're still not doing enough about it now. So um, I wanted to just give you a very basic um, walkthrough. Now you'll all know this better than me because um, I'm not great at physiology. <laughs> However, um, any trauma is brought to our attention through our senses. We're looking around, our senses are picking up information, it comes into um, our system and it passes through the sensory relay station, the thalamus. Because we're adapted to survive, it will also be passed to the amygdala. And the amygdala is our um, scanning organ and it looks for threat. If it detects threat, it activates the um, system designed to deal with threat. It does it without us thinking about it because all the information has reached it before it's reached our cortex. So we're surviving before we think about why we're, what we're surviving from. That's the basic message. And when the threat overwhelms us, actually, perhaps a lot of what is going on doesn't get to the cortex because we've just got to survive. And some of those memories, instead of being processed, are held in the amygdala as sensory memories. And for those people who have those types of sensory memories, senses that trigger and remind them of that when the amygdala is scanning something in future threats, um, set off the past experience. This is called flashback or re-experiencing. So people who've had major trauma re-experience it and they do not experience it as, as it happened then. It's happening again because it's the sensory memories they recall. It's a really scary thing. And I thought that was important to share with you because when um, Wan Lei and Becky talked to you about specialised system for dealing with these people and go through a case, just remember that. So I probably really overstayed my time. So we'll whiz through these. The impact of trauma is huge. I think the real thing to take away is it has a ripple effect. Um, it's not just um, the effect on the individual, it affects their relationships, 
Um, and they're vulnerable to re-traumatisation through re-experiencing or just because they're not so good at dealing with things and figuring out who's going to help them. So it's our job to recognise if somebody is experiencing trauma. How are we going to do that? Well, we should be preventing. Why don't we ask about, um, are you... Do you feel safe at home? Do you have a good relationship? Are you experiencing any domestic violence? Because domestic violence causes a great deal of trauma. Um, we're also seeing large numbers of adults living their lifelong consequences. How would we know? How would we screen? Maybe we could ask them. When asked, um, 80 Two percent um, said that something had gone on in their life. If we didn't ask, we only found eight percent of the people who'd um, experienced trauma. So find ways of asking and then prioritise um, protecting them using our safeguarding uh, approaches. So um, we're going to listen and validate um, it's important everybody so far this morning has said listen to the patient, um, support them, make them feel safe um, and direct them to specialist services. So what I'd like you to do um, is welcome Dr Wanley who's going to tell you about one such specialist service. Hi there, thank you everyone and thank you Liz for that great introduction to trauma and the theory and evidence behind it all. So my name's Juan Lee, uh, click, and I'm um, a GP in Curzon in Salford which is um, a practice, just a, a, a quite a deprived area and then I'm also the GP clinical lead for the Salford Primary Care Together Inclusion Service. So just a bit of a background into things, I started off as a salary GP um, for a community interest company and then uh, I was invited in 2014 to be one of the GPs at the homeless drop-in um, night shelter. Uh, from there, I was offered the role of clinical lead in um, 2016. And then um, in 2018, I worked really hard because I, I realized how important it was to um, co-locate ourselves with lots of the organizations that help with homelessness, it's not a, an individual thing that you can do, but you got to work in partnership. Um, and so we managed to move over there and Andy Burnham cut the ribbon and shared cake out. It was a really nice event. Um, then in 2019, I attended my first ever international symposium um, run by Pathways in Inclusion Health and um, Homeless Health. Uh, and it was brilliant. I came back with so many ideas that I wanted to bring back to Salford and to GM. Um, and it was just coincidentally that same year that Salford CCG were also looking to re-specify their homeless specifications. So um, one of the commissioners came and asked me, um, what do you think the service should look like for, for people experiencing homelessness? And, and I said, do you mean what I really think or what we can afford? And he said, no, what you really think? And so I just spilled out everything that came from this conference. And then um, in 2020, with lots of negotiations and quite a few concessions, we formed the inclusion service. Um, and that allowed us to kind of grow our team and that's where Becky's part of that team. So what is Inclusion Health? Well, it's any, any research, any policy agenda or any service that looks to prevent and redress health and social inequities in the most vulnerable and excluded. And there's lots of multiple overlapping features in these populations which give them extreme levels of morbidity and mortality. So um, it was at this point that I was giving a similar talk and, and someone stood up and said, do you know what, I don't agree with your service. And I was a bit surprised because I didn't expect hecklers at conferences, but, but there it was. Um, and he said, I think everyone should be treated equally because Mrs. Smith up the road who's 86 needs a specialist service as well. She has lots of needs. Why do your patients deserve anything more? And, and it's a hard argument to argue against. Um, I mean, how many people here would agree with the statement that everybody should be treated equally? Put your hands up if you, if you believe everyone should be treated equally. And so we've got maybe half, three quarters of the room. I believe that too, but luckily someone had taught me about the subtleties of language. Um, and I also came across this really interesting infographic, which sums it all up, it explains it all. So um, in this image, this young girl and this young boy have been sent by their teacher to the library. 
and they've been told to finish off their project and the librarian just gives them a chair and says, right, um, the books are over there, um, finish off your project. So the young girl um, gets given that same chair as the young boy, but she can only reach those colouring pencils, which means that her project is going to be a lovely, pretty picture with lots of colours, but she's going to fail that project. Whereas the young boy has access to all of those books up at the top, which means that he will have a fantastic project with lots of references, and he's going to get an A star, and he's going to go on to a good career. And that's equality. When we talk about equity, we talk about giving people that extra opportunity if they need it. So there, the librarian recognises that, that young girl can't reach those top books, so she gives her a higher stool. And, um, and there, they both create fantastic, fantastic projects, and they both achieve really well, really good grades. And so equality only really works when everybody starts from that same point. But equity is what you need when there's lots of disadvantage and, and certainly in the population groups that I work with there's lots of disadvantage so that's why there's an importance to have a specialist service. There we go. So um, in practice uh, it means that I work with a lot of marginalised groups so that means people experiencing homelessness, um, gypsies, travellers and show people, uh, people working in the sex industry, people who are seeking sanctuary, so asylum seekers and refugees, um, people involved in the criminal justice system and, um, and people involved in substance misuse. The kind of patients that most people would kind of really shy away from. Um, and each of these populations have a real distinct set of circumstances that act as real, real barriers to their healthcare. So um, when we talk about homelessness, there's often the trimorbidity of health. There's physical ill health, mental ill health, and substance misuse. And, I, and you've probably experienced this yourself where, where someone's using substances and so mental health say, well, we can't deal with them because they're, they're addicted, they're using these substances, that needs dealing with first. And then the addiction services say, well, we can't help them because the root cause is the mental health problems. And so they're caught in this vicious cycle that no one will kind of take on their care. And that's a lot of the, the population that we look at. Um, also, there are people in these marginalised groups that have a poor familiarity with local healthcare procedures, particularly kind of the travellers and the, um, the show people because they travel around the country. You know? And it's hard enough for me to navigate whether to call 111, whether to go to urgent care, whether to use my pharmacist or call um, GP or go straight to a and &E. It's hard enough keeping up to date with this. So when you don't use the system frequently, it's, it's really hard. Um, and that acts as a barrier for their own health care. And then people also suffer problems with languages. So if you're someone seeking sanctuary and English isn't your first language, it's very difficult to kind of access that information and, and get the health care that you need um, if you're from another country where the culture of healthcare might be completely different. Likewise, um, a lot of the um, travellers that we work with um, don't really engage with um, public education system so they don't really speak um, uh, uh, well they don't they do speak but they don't read or write very well and um, kind of pointing in uh, in course was that when COVID really hit and everything went digital and all the information was being sent out by text messages or letters and things this whole population was kind of forgotten about because they didn't know how to access they just knew that the GP practice had their doors shut and what do we do about that so um, though there are lots of distinct differences in these populations, there's a huge crossover of commonalities, things like insecure accommodation, discrimination, socio-economic deprivation and stigma, um, and stereotyping for these populations, um, and also a huge lack of trust in professionals. Sometimes that's because of some of the reasons I've listed above, but sometimes because they've, they've spent time in the care system and, um, and they've not been treated well by the system, and so they have a real mistrust for anything that might be statutory or within the system. And then there's also people that, um, th these groups also suffer from um, struggling to register with GPs, uh, because I don't know if anyone's registered with a GP recently, but one of the first questions the receptionist asks is, have you got any ID or have you got any proof of address? And when you're homeless or um, when you're travelling around and you don't have that, how do you access that healthcare? Just, just to let you know that you don't need those things to register as the GP. Um, so, uh, next slide. So, Liz has mentioned Maslow's hierarchy of need, and it, it talks about what you need to really reach that full potential to be the person you want to be. And when the things that dominate your mind are where you're going to get your next meal, where you're going to get your next income from, where you're going to get your, your um, next safe place to sleep, you're always in that survival mode that Liz was talking about, and you can never reach that full potential because um, you're always at that bottom layer of Maslow's hierarchy. There we go. So, though I see trauma every day in the inclusion service, I also see it very frequently in um, 
my mainstream general practice. And, and what does that trauma look like? Well, to me, it's, it's people that attend frequently. You might see in their notes that um, they see lots of different practitioners and they never get their health needs met. And they seem to say the same thing, but they keep going around seeing lots of different people. Or you might find that patients DNA, and, and lots of colleagues get very angry about this because people shouldn't be DNA because we are such... Um, you know, it's such a, such a high, um, high demand for our, our services that when people aren't attending appointments, it's, it's really frustrating for us. Or you might see lots of letters from A&E that people are attending as emergencies or they're, or they're only turning up on their duty doctor list. Um, and then you've got the patients that have lots of medically unexplained symptoms, things that don't fit quite into those textbook categories. People also with really poorly managed chronic conditions, so HbA1c's in their hundreds, and multi multimorbidity, and people that are refusing treatment when you think, well, this is the obvious thing that you need to do, what, what's stopping you? All of those are things that flag up in my mind, and I think, I wonder if there's trauma involved. And so the traditional view for a lot of these patients, they, they come out um, and they start acting out, they start screaming and shouting, um, they start complaining, they, they can be um, labelled as manipulative, as pushing buttons, and colleagues get very upset about these types of patients, get very angry about them. But actually, when you look at them through a trauma-informed lens, you start to take a step back and see that there's, there's other reasons behind it. So, so that acting out might be because they've never had a role model to show them how to emotionally regulate these, these um, problems that they have, and they're very dysregulated. Those manipulative patients, they're actually seeking to get their needs met, and they're trying to find other ways to get their needs met, and, and we're not actually um, serving them properly because we're not actually finding what their needs are. People that that um, you don't really believe because their, their reactions or their, their delays to uh, what, what they're bringing up seem really slow and delayed. Well, they might be having dissociative symptoms um, and that's a, a trait that, that they've got that, that shows to me that there's trauma going on. So trauma-informed care calls for a change in organisational culture where there's an emphasis that's placed on understanding, on respecting and appropriately responding to the effects of trauma at all levels. And I think the NHS in itself as a, as a huge organisation is, is a long way away from that. But I think this is where each of us can take back to our own practices that we can start to start to make that sea of change happen and start to bring that trauma-informed practice back to our own practices. So, so in practice, that talks about empowering patients. It's, it's working on strength-based uh, models. So that person that's um, been in detox nine or 10 times and they call you up and they say, Doc, I, I managed to, to stay free of drink for three days, but, but I've started back on it now. That patient, if you focus in on those three days, that's where the strength-based brilliance comes from you know you, you focus in and you say you managed to stay three days without drinking you know with your history that's a phenomenal thing that you've done and you build on that and that's where they can feel encouraged and they can feel you know feel that they've got some strength to kind of get through things we also talk about patient choice so in, in a trauma-informed service you need to offer lots of choice so a young girl that might have been uh, abused by a group of men for, for 10, 15 years um, calls up the receptionist with a sh sore shoulder and, um, and the receptionist says, yep, you can, you can see Dr. Um, Stephen Smith on, on Tuesday. I can guarantee you that, that that girl is not going to show up to that appointment and it will be end up in a, in a DNA because the receptionist never gave her a choice. If, if the receptionist said to you, would you like to see a male or a female GP? She doesn't even have to delve into what it was about. That simple choice would offer that girl that chance to say, well, I, I'd prefer to see the female. And the receptionist might say, well, the female GPs are three weeks later than the male GP. Is that still OK? And if she says it's OK, then, then you know, that's giving her that choice and that's showing that, that trauma-informed approach. Also working in collaboration, so not just dealing with that patient in front of you and, and just seeing that that's the case, but dealing with that wider, wider group of people. So you can't just be that support leg for that patient. You've got to use that whole network of support groups, of um, support workers, of friends and family to build that structure and help kind of give that stability to that, that person. Um, and we also talk about um, working and, and making sure that the, the patient feels very safe, and that's physical safety, looking at your procedure, as how, you, how you offer procedures do investigations but also um, emotional safety that making sure that people feel very safe when they come to to that environment um, and um, and then they've also got to really trust you you've got to have a trusting relationship with these with these people so um, you've got to do what you say you're going to do and you also need to speak about what expectations they can have of you um, to have um, that good therapeutic relationship 
So what facilitates disclosure? Some of these things are within our gift um, and a really good phrase that I find really helpful is to say to people that if I, if I see a yellow flag where a trauma might be involved, I might say to them, um, sometimes talking about early life experiences um, can give us an understanding of your current experiences. And that's often followed by a pause. Don't rush people there. And then I could say to people, if you feel you want to talk about this, you can, but if you don't want to talk about it now, that's absolutely fine. But, but just know that you can come and talk to me about this if you want to. And that can sometimes just be that open door for them to come and speak to you and, and um, explain some of these things. Some of the other things that encourage people to disclose are that they might uh, have a family and not wish their young children to kind of go through the same things that they've gone through and they, and they get quite frightened by that. Um, other things are that uh, they have a safe relationship and trusting relationship with you and so they feel like they can open up to you. Um, sometimes it's because their social network are encouraging them and saying to them, you should come and speak to your GP about this. And sometimes it's, it's media stories, things like the Jimmy Sam uh, the Prince Andrew stories that came up with the Me Too movement, that encourages people to come forwards. There's also this idea of test balloons um, where patients, particularly new patients, come in with a, a handful of balloons and they'll let off a small balloon um, just to see how you'll deal with that balloon. And so they might come in and they just say, oh, I've got a, a sore foot. And if you don't even look at them and you say, a sore foot, um, have you tried taking any painkillers? Because if not, you should really just go to the pharmacy. And that's you popping their balloon. And so they're probably not going to bring any new balloons over to you. Whereas if you deal with it in a sensitive way and you just ask them about their, their sore toe and ask them, well, what's bothering them about them? And have they tried going to the pharmacist? You can still deliver that same information, but in a, a caring and sensitive way. Then then they might come next time and just release another balloon. And then you might find that at the third or fourth attempt, they they actually release their full balloon and dis disclose that trauma that really kind of affected them. Um, so in the, in the general tips, I've also talked about kind of um, that same phrase because it's really important to just tell people that it's okay to talk about these, these early experiences. But just be really curious about it and, and allow yourself to ask the questions. Don't be afraid about it and give people the time and the space to talk openly if that's okay. Um, also, there's that, that using that question as almost a routine screening. I put a question mark because it's something that I've started doing. When I see those yellow flags of people that might attend with trauma, I just start to ask that question. So what do we do when people do disclose trauma to us? Because sometimes it can be quite frightening, it can quite be quite a heavy, heavy experience for us. Well, it's really important. A lot of our speakers have spoke today about validating, um, empathising with them and, and, and believing them and empowering them to, to say that. Lots of patients that I have um, with fibromyalgia just feel quite embarrassed by their, their symptoms. And when you say to them, no, I, I know what it's like. It's, it's an awful disability. It robs you of your independence and it, and it is horrible and painful and you, can, you can't do all the things that you want to do. Just, just validating them and saying that you believe them can be a really powerful tool in that relationship. Um, survivors also talk about being really positive and speaking in a calm, calm and supportive and accepting way um, as something that kind of encourages them to kind of talk more. Um, make sure that you follow safeguarding procedures and you ask permission if you are going to share anything with other groups. And also just remember, just give that time and space to people because it might not all come out in one consultation. It might take a, a, a few consultations. So what doesn't help? And these are stories that I've heard of from, from patients themselves. Sometimes people blame or doubt the survivor and, and it's really shocking, but you know, I've, I've heard from a, a young person who said that um, she was abused when she was about 14 years of age. She went with a group of boys um, to take some drugs at their house and then the abuse followed after that. And a clinician said to her, well, if you followed them to take drugs, what did you really expect was going to happen? And that is not a helpful, that is a big, <coughs> that's a big no, no, don't do anything like that. Don't dismiss, don't minimize um, what people are saying. You know, I've heard about people that disclose that um, someone very close to them passed away. And then the clinician says, right, did you mention that you, you smoke? Have you ever thought about giving up smoking? It's kind of like just out of the blue, just dismissing everything they're saying. So, so try not to do that. Um, try not to treat um, the person that's um, disclosed trauma differently or, or give any kind of cold um, body language or turn away because you're, you're frightened yourself and you don't know how to deal with it. Um, don't promise to keep secrets when you can't um, and don't forget to take care of yourself because as much of the compassion that's going outwards you have to throw inwards in towards yourself because you can be hearing some really powerful and traumatic things that can affect you so you might not want to just call your next patient and straight away just take a break call up a colleague put a screen message just say you know I could do with a brew right now just just get that extra help if you can need uh, if, you, if you need it um, and don't say or communicate that 
don't tell me these things because I don't want to know because there are plenty of clinicians out there that do that. Um, and sometimes it's just protected because the landscape's so awful at the moment, it's so busy in general practice that people just try and protect themselves. But think of the person on the other end of what, what your communication skills are delivering. Um, so I'm just going to end on this final quote from um, Van der Kolk who wrote the Body Keeps score. Um, he says that traumatised people chronically feel unsafe inside their own bodies. The past is alive in the form of a gnawing interior discomfort and their bodies are constantly bombarded by visceral warning signs and, and in an attempt to control these procedures they often become an expert at ignoring their gut feelings and in numbing awareness of what is played out inside. They essentially learn to hide from themselves and so they're not going to present in the textbook fashion. They're going to offer you different symptoms at different times and you're going to think, what is going on? I don't even believe these people, but this is when you need to look through with a trauma-informed lens and start to ask, not what's wrong with you, but what's happened to you? Thank you. I'll pass you over to Becky and I was going to talk about it. Now, I know it's really, really close to dinner time and everybody is getting hungry, so I'm going to go as quick as possible to get to the case study. But my plea is, when I do the little interactive stuff, that you guys don't leave me hanging. That's the deal break. If I finish on time, you have to join in. So I will just whiz through this first part, really. I'm going to talk more about the inclusion team in our model. I could talk all day. You know, you will get the slides. Contact us any time. We love talking about what we do. Um, before I start, I want to tell you a little bit about Salford, um, and this was data from the end of, it was December 2020. There were approximately 1,160 active cases, active homeless cases open to Salford City Council, um, plus 1,000 individuals from the cohorts of the asylum seekers. Now this is people in statutory accommodation, emergency accommodation, things like hostels, B&Bs, hotels, dispersed properties. Um, shared houses, things like that, but that is just the people that we know about. That does include people sleeping on the street as well. However, there are so many, so many people who are also hidden homeless. They'll be sofa surfing. This is getting far worse due to the pandemic. You know, relationships break down. People are, you know, after lockdown have moved out, have nowhere to go. They're just staying with friends, family, and you know, they're running out of places to go. So there is a lot of hidden homeless as well. Um, why I bring this up is because we know there is a vicious cycle between trauma um, and homelessness. The trauma drives homelessness and the homelessness can increase traumatic exposure. So it's just a, a vicious cycle. Um, so our aims, as Juan Lay has already said, is to remove um, barriers to accessing primary health care. The fact that um, Juan Lay pointed out already about the no ID, that is so important. We've got um, a lady who works quite closely with us, an expert by experience. She's a previous registered patient. She slept in a doorway for a very long time of a GP practice. They'd come out in the morning, give her a hot drink, offer her clothes, secondhand clothes, bedding, but they wouldn't register her. They said she didn't have ID, she could not be registered. This is not true anymore. You do not need ID, you do not need proof of address. This seems to be cropping up more and more at the moment. I'm doing a lot of work supporting people in registering once they move on from us. Um, I imagine it's because practices are swamped in the response to the pandemic, but people do not need ID or proof of address. Uh, we've got face-to-face -face appointments and multiple outreach and surgeries across Salford City. And we've also got an in-reach service that we've just launched, launched in Salford Royal. Um, we're only a tiny team, we've got two GPs, we've got two ANPs, one healthcare assistant, myself, I'm non-clinical, I'm a case manager, and we've got two admin support, so we're only a tiny little team. Um, the way we try and remove barriers is by making it as simple as possible for our patients to contact us. So instead of having a, a landline, we do have a landline, but it's not predominantly used, we have a patient mobile phone. Patients can contact us through text, ringing, WhatsApp, any time of the day, obviously if it's out of working hours, they have to leave a message, it's not a 24 hour service, but there's no, no set times. You don't have to ring at 8 a.m. for an appointment. You don't have to ring after two for test results. It's not like that, they can contact us any day. WhatsApp is really important for us because people will have phones but might not have credit, whereas you can always get some free ID somewhere, go and connect to somebody's ID. 
We have uh, drop-in and outreach sessions with Salford Loaves and Fishes. We work really closely with them, um, a charity, a third sector charity in Salford and um, the Mustard Tree. And we've got really strong links with the homeless team, uh, the housing homeless team. This is so important. We couldn't do it without them. I've heard so many people this morning talking about partnership working and it is key. We have weekly MDTs to support wraparound care. And again, those people from those other teams join us. Um, not just the housing, we've got people from the Bloodborne Virus team, people from the Homeless Palliative Care team, um, people from the hospital safeguarding, just to make sure that nobody's falling through the gaps. And relationships are prioritised. This is key to us. This is our new phrase we're using, persistent engagement. We've got people still on our books that we've not contacted or had contact with, for maybe six months, nine months, we just keep trying them and eventually we'll find them, we'll get through to them, we'll find them along the way. Um, we won't always pick up somebody for a long time but we don't give up on them. And we strive to create those safe environments. We've heard already about the impacts of trauma. People need to feel safe physically and emotionally. This, um, to give you a bit of an idea, this was run in September. We've got 407 patients, it's gone up again already. Predominantly male, 332 males, 75 females, although that number of females is um, going up and up and up all the time. I think when I started this time last year, we had about 19 registered females, so it's really shot up. Um, and recently we've registered uh, a number of uh, pregnant women as well. So the trend is changing. You can see as well there from the age groups, they're mainly people in the 20s to mid 30s. Um, so I started in September and had a real focus on this partnership working and we set up a mobile clinic. I won't go into too much detail because I'd like to get to the case study, but the mobile clinic was with St John's Ambulance. We parked at the Salford Precinct and it was a drop-in. Um, it was on every two weeks. And the main aims of this was to capture new people who didn't know about our service, reduce inequality and um, you know, provide access for healthcare and to try and support early identification of chronic disease and managing any diseases. So that was set up when I got this email from um, one of the housing support officers who told me about this couple. So, let me just see. So, the email detailed more in detail about these, but I've um, picked out the key points. They were a married couple. The male was 48, he's a, he's a veteran, suffers with PTSD, cirrhosis of the liver, hep C, carrier, history of self-neglect and rough sleeping. A female, 47, depressed mood, very wary of strangers. Um, again, history of self-neglect and rough sleeping. Both had been victims of um, financial and domestic abuse by their son. Both had a history of um, drug use, injecting drug use. Both were very, very cautious. They really did not want to meet new people. They certainly didn't want to attend a surgery. Um, however, working with those other partners and the housing support officer, she encouraged them to just come down and meet us. You know, she said, it won't be in the doctor's surgery, just pop down for an informal chat. We had no other medical history apart from, you know, hearsay and what we'd been told. So she chaperoned them down to the mobile clinic. It was the first one we did, it was the 18th of December. It was absolutely Baltic on the Salford Precinct. And I kept thinking, I can't complain because people are sleeping in this weather, but it was freezing. And they came along. What would be, I would like just shout out to me, what are your first thoughts of these two people? What do you think the barriers might be for them? Or what's your first initial reaction to these, these two people? And this is where you've got to go, otherwise I will uh, go over dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, we're not shy. What do you think? What are your first thoughts? What do you think? God, just shout out. Most definitely mental health problems, thank you. Anything else? Scared, yeah, most definitely. Trust, yeah, not trusting, definitely. I heard some, did somebody say hungry? Yeah, definitely. There were so many, and you know, you're completely right, so much mistrust. They really didn't want to come to a surgery. They'd had bad experiences before. We were in the middle of, um, well, we were in lockdown number two. So, you know, that people were telling them you can't go in together, things like that. So they really, really did not want to be seen. However, it was a condition. The housing officer had said, well, if you guys come with us, you know, it looks good on your housing application, basically. It was a bit of a bribe, a bit of a carrot, and they came down. 
it was brilliant and we couldn't believe it for our first encounter they came and because it was our first one and it was freezing there was nobody else around so they came and they sat in the ambulance it's like a well-being ambulance so it's got quite a big space the doors were not closed because the gentleman suffers PTSD and he cannot deal with being in an enclosed room so the doors were open there was no one around they had privacy they were welcome to sit together they didn't have to separate and they were just able to talk without any time constraints they were probably there for about 45 minutes just having a general chat with myself and with our um, A&P Liz. Eventually they both felt comfortable enough to say yes we'll register and we'll actually have some health checks. We couldn't believe it, we thought this would be a really really long journey. Um, so they did, they, there and then we did the health checks. We didn't say right let's book you in in two weeks, come back then. We did them then and there so they had a full health check, full new patient health check. It came to doing bloods, and obviously they were both very difficult to, have, um, to get blood from. We had the Bloodborne Virus team on hand in the next room in the ambulance, who um, could do the next, you know, take bloods from the next for us. So again, it wasn't stop, we'll come back, we'll make a new appointment. They did, they did them then and there, and that's when he, um, you know, disclosed his Hep C diagnosis and how he hadn't completed any treatment. He was very, very scared. Um, with his cirrhosis of the liver he just assumed he was going to die so there was no, no point in doing anything about it so they were on hand to deal with that um, the outreach worker was with us so she did an immediate referral to Achieve and they had some outreach sessions with Achieve again they didn't have to go to the building and wait and go through the rigmarole of the appointments the partnership working was so important um, and we kept you know, working like this, working in partnership. And now actually both, um, well later on both patients came to the surgery and you know, came in to different surgeries and were quite happy to have an appointment. Um, with support over this, it's coming up for a year, they have both maintained their prescriptions from ourselves and from, uh, from Achieve, from the drug and alcohol team. Um, he's completed his Hep C treatment and he was given extra support from the Bloodborne Virus team and St Anne's Hospice in regards to living with a chronic disease. And the change in his attitude is amazing because he just thought there's no point, no point in looking after myself because I'm, I'm dying basically. So that was key and that scared some of the support workers when we said St Anne's Hospice they freaked out a little bit we said no it's managing this chronic disease she's gained weight now she's more willing to attend appointments and discuss health everyday everyday health concerns not crisis health concerns she was talking about she thinks she's going through the menopause last week she, she phoned up she was constipated it wasn't when they were at real crisis and they've both maintained temporary accommodation and the plan is for them to get their own tenancy they're just waiting for it to be assigned now this is a journey these are brilliant things that have happened, but they will fall off the radar. We might not hear from them for over a week. We'll have the MDT, who's heard from them, where are they, has anybody laid eyes on them? They still need that intensive support. We, you know, they're still on a journey with us. We will keep working with them until we feel the time is ready to transition them back into mainstream services. Um, and that can be different for everybody. Some people are with us for a very short time, others will be with us for much longer. The key message that we really want to um, promote to you guys is trauma is everybody's responsibility. These two people are, are still complex and can be very chaotic, but as my colleagues have said, you will see people with trauma in everyday services. There'll be people in this room who've experienced trauma and it has to be everybody's responsibility. We as individuals, as a workforce, as a nation, have to begin to try and understand how trauma prevents, uh, presents itself and what we can do to support people and support them in their recovery. It's so, so key because there is a recovery, as Liz has been through, but people can be re-traumatised and through very, what we see as very small actions. So that is the thing we really want you to take away today, that trauma is everybody's responsibility. Thinking about the tips and you know, ideas that One Layer has given you and how we can support people in the recovery. Um, I, you know, thank you so much for listening. It was a real whiz, like I said, you'll get the slides and I'll pop my email out on them. Anytime, just drop us an email if you want to come and see what we do. We'd love to have people come in, you know, come watch what we do. And if we've got time, I know we're very happy to take questions as well. Thank you.